beginning with chapter 8 of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews turns his attention from the person of Christ as our great and merciful high priest to the cross of Christ, the supreme sacrifice by which Jesus reconciled the human race to God and uh, redeemed us from the condemnation of the law. Our next three studies, chapter 8, 9, and 10, will be dealing with this important subject because the cross of Christ is the central message of the New Testament. In fact, if you were to read the first four books of the New Testament, referred to as the Gospels, you will discover that one-third of those writings concentrate on the Passion Week. That is how important the cross of Christ was to the Gospel writers. Then, when, come, when you come to Paul, in the book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, Paul refers to the cross as the power of God unto salvation. In chapter 2, he tells the readers that when he came to Corinth, he wanted to know nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Or when you go to Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 14, Paul tells us that I, I glory in nothing else but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the cross of Christ is extremely important to us Christians. And that is why our next three studies are going to concentrate on this wonderful topic. Now, our study today will be chapter 8 of Hebrews. But the first two verses, the Apostle Paul deals with the... Uh, he deals with the... Uh, the conclusion of his study on Christ as our great high priest. And uh, so I'm going to start by reading the first two verses of chapter 8 of Hebrews. Now, this is the main point of the things we have been saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. The writer of Hebrews has been discussing this wonderful topic of Christ our high priest from chapter 5 verse 10 and this is the conclusion. And of course we spent several studies on this wonderful truth, the wonderful thing that Christ is not only our saviour but he is also our merciful and great high priest who is able to sympathize with our weakness and to help us in times of need. But now turning from chapter 8 verse 3 onwards, the writer of Hebrews turns to the cross of Christ. And I cannot underestimate this subject because to understand the cross of Christ is to understand the gospel. In fact, the apostle Paul identifies the cross of Christ with the gospel, the incredible good news of salvation. So let's start with verse 3 and let's see what it says. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. Verse 4, if he were on earth, he would not be a high priest, since they are priests who offer the gifts according to the law who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Now, dear reader, listen to what the writer is trying to get across. In the earthly sanctuary, there were priests and there were sacrifices, but all of this was shadows and types. None of this was able to save mankind. They pointed forward to the coming of Christ. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that those types and shadows were fulfilled in Jesus Christ in his life, death and resurrection. Now, of course, you remember we covered this issue of gifts and sacrifices. The gift that Christ offers to his Father on our behalf is his perfect righteousness, 
which satisfies the positive demands of the law, obey and live. The sacrifice, which is what we are going to concentrate on now, is what met the justice of the law. On the cross, Jesus paid the complete price for your sins and for my sins. So please remember, dear listener, that this is why Christ is the, the very center of the gospel message. When Jesus came to this world, he came to be the gospel. He came to be the incredible good news of salvation. Hence, according to verse 6, Christ is a mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Now I need to pause here and explain to you about the word covenants. There are two words in the original language that can be translated into our English word covenant. One is sunteke, the other one is diateke. Sunteke can be compared with a contract, on agreement, an agreement between two parties. That word never appears in the New Testament. The new covenant is called diateke and is equivalent to a will or to a promise. Now when God came to the Jews at Mount Sinai and gave them the law, he never intended that to be a sunteke, a contract. But the Jews entered into that contract. They said to God, all that you say we will do. Now God entered back into that contract not because he wanted them to be saved by this method. But one of the problems that the Jews faced in the Exodus is they had failed to realize the sinfulness of their nature. And so God knew that they could not keep that covenant. He knew that the old covenant, which is salvation by works, would be a failure. But he entered into it not for his sake, but for their sake. The reason he entered in the old covenant was to open their eyes to show them that they are incapable, just like you and I are incapable of saving ourselves. In other words, one of the reasons why God gave the law on Mount Sinai to the Jews of the Exodus is not to solve the sin problem, but to expose it. You see, it's the law that convinces us that we are sinners. And so the old covenant was a failure. And the apostle of this Hebrews will, write, will, will bring this out. The new covenant, on the other hand, is a will. It's a promise made by one benefiting another. And so, with this in mind, we go to verse 7 onwards, where the new covenant is explained. Hebrews 8 verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So the old covenant, or the first covenant, which was made at Mount Sinai, was faulty. But where was the fault? Well, let's look at it. Verse 8. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Where was the fault? Not with the covenant, not with the law, rather, but with the people. Now, I need to clarify something that needs to be clarified because of misunderstanding in the minds of many Christians. The old covenant has nothing to do with time. There are some Christians who think that the old covenant applied from Moses to Christ. And when Christ came along, he did away with the old covenant, which means to them, he did away with the law and replaced it by grace. Nothing could be further from the truth than this. You see, God doesn't have more than one way of saving man. From the time of Adam's fall to the very last person, there is only one way that God saves mankind. And that is by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. You see, let me explain the problem. The problem is that the reason why God entered into the old covenant, which was not something new at Mount Sinai, it is because that is the, the natural instinct of the human being. Our nature, by nature, is legalistic. We want to earn our salvation. And so what happens is this, that God allowed to enter the Old Covenant to open their eyes. But the Old Covenant existed right from the very beginning. For example, when Adam and Eve sinned, 
they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. That's the old covenant. Man trying to cover his filthy, filthy rags with fig leaves. But those leaves dried and fell off. So they were a failure. And so God had to make skins based on the sacrifice of animals representing the new covenant. You look at the offering of Cain and Abel. Why did God accept the offering of Abel and not Cain? Abel offered an animal sacrifice as a faith response to the promise of God that one day one of the seeds of Adam and Eve, which is of course Christ, would be the Messiah and who would die for our sins. Cain, on the other hand, offered up what he produced from his garden. So the idea of salvation by works did not, was not come into existence in Mount Sinai. The old covenant existed from Adam and it will continue to the end of time. That is why in Romans chapter, sorry, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 onwards, the apostle Paul uses the two sons of Abraham, Ishmael and Isaac, to represent the two covenants. One, based on salvation by works of the law or by good works, which is represented by Hagar and Ishmael, produced by Adam's own effort. The other, Isaac, which was based on God's promise, is based on, of course, what God promised and fulfilled after Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So, what we read in Hebrews 8 is that the old covenant was faulty, not because the fault was with the law, but because it was faulty because of the people who were incapable of keeping the law. Now, I want to make it clear, we must not do the mistake of the Jews of the Exodus. When they failed to keep the law, do you know what they did? They took the law of God, made human rules, which Jesus Christ called the traditions of men, and you know, folks, as a result of that, Jesus accused the Jews of traditions of men which does not save, which is not the fulfillment of the law. Paul, who was a Jew himself and a Pharisee, made the same mistake. And he brings this out in chapter 7 of uh, Romans. Let me read to you his own experience. Because he was a Jew, a victim to Judaism. And this is what he said, chapter 7 of Romans and verse 8 and 9. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desires, for apart from the law, sin was dead. What does he mean by that? Well, if you look at the previous verse, he, goes, he tells us that I did not know sin, except the law says, thou shalt not covet. You see, the mistake the Jews made is that if you keep the law in terms of X, you are keeping the law. But no, the law doesn't de only demand perfect X, it demands perfect desires, perfect motives, perfect thoughts, and even perfect nature. And Paul did not know that as a Jew. But when he understood the commandment which says, Thou shalt not covet, and coveting has nothing to do with X of the body, but the cherished desires of the mind, he goes on to say that I discovered that I was full of evil desires as a Pharisee, even though I was not doing the acts. And so in verse 9, he says, I was a once alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So going back to Rome, Hebrews 8, the purpose of the old covenant was to open the eyes of the our self-respectability. That's what the law does. It shows us how rotten we are inside so that the new covenant may become very desirable. So let's go on and see what it says. Verse 10 of Hebrews 8, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. What is this new covenant? After those days, that is after the old covenant has done its job says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now the difference between the old and the new covenant is the old covenant, the law was written on tables of stone. It was some external rules which they had to obey. The new covenant is no longer external rules. It is 
the desires of the heart that God puts in us. In other words, when you accept Christ as your Savior, there is a transformation that takes place in your heart. That is what it means that the law was written in our hearts. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you and you experience the new birth, he brings with you an ingredient that you and I cannot produce. What is that ingredient? It is that agape love of God. That love which was manifested to us in Jesus Christ. So my dear people, the new covenant does not do away with the law, as some people say. What was nailed on the cross was not the Ten Commandments. It was not the law. It was we who were nailed on the cross. See, there is no problem between God and the law. The law is a revelation of God's character. At least the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law is a revelation of God's character, which is love. That is why in the New Testament, whether it's Christ or John or Paul, they all say the same thing. Love is the fulfillment of the law. And that love is the agape, self-emptying, everlasting, unconditional love which is talk, spoken about. And when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you, he brings with you that ingredient called agape. He transforms the heart and keeping the law becomes a delight. It becomes something that we want to do. And not in the letter, but in the spirit. In fact, in Romans 7 verse 6, Paul tells us that we, when we become Christians, we serve God not according to the letter, that is not a set of rules, but according to the spirit of the law, which is love. And this is what it says in verse 10, that God is going to write the law in our minds and in our hearts. By that, he does not mean that he will tattoo the law. If you do an autopsy of a dead Christian, you won't find the law written in their heart. What he's saying is he will put the desires of the law into our heart so that it becomes a spontaneous desire. Not something that I have to do, but something that becomes a natural part of my new nature that I receive from Christ. So with that in mind, let's go to verse 11 of Hebrews 8. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. You see, under the old covenant, you serve God out of fear. You'd, you were so afraid of him because every time you failed, you thought he was out to get you. Let me give you a good illustration. When God created Adam and Eve, he placed them in the Garden of Eden. Eden. And in the middle of that garden, there was a tree that was referred to as the tree of good and evil. God said to them, all the trees of the garden, all the fruits you can eat, but the fruit of the tree of, this, of the knowledge of good and evil, that you cannot touch. If you do, that very same day you will die. Well, sad to say, Adam and Eve partook of that tree. And the moment they partook of the tree, they discovered they were naked because now the glory of God no longer covered them. And you know, that evening when God came to talk to them, do you know what they did? They hid. Why? Because no longer was, was God to them a God of love. He was a God of vengeance. He was, out, he was coming out to execute them. So they hid. They were afraid of God. And ever since then, man is afraid of God. He's running away from him. But once you understand the incredible good news of the gospel, once you realize that God loves you with an, with an everlasting love, once you realize that he so loved the world that he gave us his son, that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life, once you realize that God is on our side, as Romans 8.31 tells us, then you are no longer afraid of God. You call him our father. You treat him as somebody who loves you and wants to help you and has one desire, and that is to take you to heaven. So we know the Lord as he wants us to know him. That's the function of the new covenant because it is no longer a covenant under law, but it's a covenant under grace. And the word grace means doing something wonderful, not to your friend, but to your enemy. And that's exactly what God did for us in Jesus Christ. In Romans 5, 
6 to 10, we are told four things. While we were helpless, that is, incapable of saving ourselves, while we were ungodly, which means we were wicked, while we were still sinners, and even while we were God's enemies, we were, past tense, reconciled to God by the death of his son. That, of course, is the new covenant. And when the word reconcile is used, it means the big barrier, the big gap between a holy God and sinful man was removed at the cross. You know, in Isaiah 59 and verse 2, the prophet tells us that sin has separated. There's millions of light years between a holy God and sinful man. Big, enormous gap. But Christ came to bridge that gap to remove every barrier between a holy God and sinful man. And that's, of course, the wonderful truth of the new covenant. So I, I read in verse 12, which brings this out very clearly. Listen to this. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deed I will remember no more. Isn't that wonderful? God no longer remembers our failures, our shortcomings. Yes, Sometimes when we forget, we, 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 don't, we can't forget when somebody has done something wrong to us. But God remembers that this no more. Why? Because he has removed every barrier that separates us from him to the death of his son. And so I read in verse 13, in that he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and grown old is ready to vanish away. Now the new covenant, as I mentioned, is not an old covenant. You know, the Bible tells us that God chose us in Christ from the foundation of the world. And that's in Ephesians 1 and verse 4. The God tells us that it, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. But that was a will that God made. It was a promise. And God first gave that promise to Adam and Eve immediately after they fell. So when God came to see them that evening, they had sinned. He did not come to execute them. He came to give them a promise. And the promise is found in Genesis 3 verse 15. That one of their descendants, which is of course Jesus Christ, will be the Messiah. He kept that promise alive all through the Old Testament in types, in shadows, in all kinds of promises. But until Jesus died on the cross, that promise could not become a reality. Look at a will. When a will is made and sealed, that will is a, a note of promise that somebody is going to receive my assets. But that promise does not become valid or reality until the person who makes the will dies. And that's exactly what happened at the cross. At the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, the promise became a reality. So that we living in the New Testament times are not depending on a promise of God for salvation. We are depending on a history that took place 2,000 years ago. The Germans have a wonderful name for it. They call it Heil Geschichte, salvation history. By his birth, life, death, and resurrection, the promise became a reality. Listen to these words of Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1. It's a wonderful promise. And I can give you many texts because you see, dear reader, this is what the gospel is all about. It is the reality of the promise made by God to Adam and Eve, kept alive in the Old Testament, but now is a reality. I'm going to read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, 9, and 10. Now, this is one of the last letters Paul wrote before he was executed as a martyr. In fact, there were only two letters he wrote from the prison in Rome before he was executed. And 2 Timothy is one of them. The reason he wrote this letter to Timothy is to pass the mantle on to Timothy. And he's instruction was, Timothy, preach this gospel, guard it, because there'll be false teachers who will come and pervert it. And he was absolutely right. But this is what he wrote in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, verse 8, 9, and 10. Therefore, 
do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. In this verse 8, Paul is telling Timothy that don't be ashamed of the gospel. Now remember, Timothy was an introvert. But Paul is saying, Timothy, be brave through the power of God, which is found in the gospel. And then in verse 9, he describes this gospel. Who, that is Christ, or God through Christ, has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Holy living does not contribute towards our salvation, but it is a demonstration that we are saved. That's why it's very important. The world needs to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. So this is what he says. Not according to our works, because our works don't save us at all, dear listener, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Isn't that wonderful? That's why in Revelation 14 and verse 6, it is called the everlasting gospel. Everlasting because it was planned from everlasting. And also everlasting because when you accept that gospel, you pass from death to everlasting life. But now let's look at verse 10. But has now been revealed. Verse 9 is dealing with the promise. But verse 10 is dealing with the reality. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now listen what Christ has accomplished. Who has abolished death? And I know what you might be thinking. If he abolished death, why do Christians die? Well, in the Bible, especially the New Testament, there are two kinds of death. The first death is called sleep. That's what all Christians and everybody experiences. A good example is Lazarus. When Lazarus died, Jesus told his disciples, Lazarus is sleeping, let's go and wake him up. Referring to the first death. But the book of Revelation, especially verse 20, talks about the second death, which is the wages of sin, which is what Christ experienced on the cross and therefore could abolish it. Listen to this. But has now been revealed by the appearing of Christ, uh, Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, but it doesn't stop there, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Isn't that wonderful? That's the incredible good news of the gospel. And may you rejoice in it is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your new covenant. We thank you that you did not leave us in the mess we found ourselves because of the fall. But you promised us one day that Christ would come and we thank you that he's already come 2,000 years ago and redeemed us. And now we live under the new covenant, a covenant of grace. Thank you for this wonderful covenant that you have made for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.